Well, Jacques Derrida um, is a very, very interesting thinker of the 20th century. Um, I think one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century. And uh, I came across him a little bit as an undergraduate, but then as a, a graduate student during my time at Cambridge University. And there was the famous instance where he was uh, put forward for an honorary doctorate, which usually goes through on the nod in the Senate. But somebody registered that they were not happy in the Senate vote on this. Um, and this led to a, a very interesting few weeks where academics put forward arguments for or, and against Derrida getting this um, doctorate. And as a student, it was always very interesting to see which side of the fence my own supervisors <laughs> and the staff of the theology department came down on. The arguments against Derrida were that basically he was undermining the whole notion of truth and a university st stands for truth. So Derrida was effectively undermining the whole notion of what a university stands for. So it was madness to give this awful heretic uh, a, an academic honor. Um, and eventually, of course, he got the doctorate and uh, I think by a reasonable margin of votes as well, uh, came to lecture at, at Cambridge, uh, which was an extraordinary occasion and people sort of filling this lecture theatre, an absolutely extraordinary occasion. Um, and he later reflected on the whole absurdity of this story and, uh, and the, the kind of rumour mill that's, that surrounds a philosopher uh, of any note and notoriety. And uh, certainly the, the rumour mill has surrounded Derrida. He's been allied with uh, relativism and the whole idea that he's attacking truth and abandoning truth and uh, were trapped within language, and all of these ideas have been attributed to Derrida, I think, without much close reading of his text. Um, now, I wouldn't want to defend Derrida on every point and everything he says, and I'm sure some of his language isn't always as careful as it might be. Uh, but it was very amusing seeing a top university debating whether to give one of the great living philosophers an honorary degree some of the honorary degrees that are given out by academic institutions these days. It, um, the whole thing was quite amusing, and I think driven by people who had hardly picked up a book by Derrida. Um, so he's one of these people who, who are quite difficult to read, and, and there's, there's no denying it. He doesn't go in for, for clarity, because I think partly he wants to challenge the idea that there is a clarity about the truth. Um, so even though Kierke, uh, Derrida isn't entirely like someone like Kierkegaard who writes in, in these very artful ways, there is still an artfulness and a poetry about his genres. Uh, and certainly he experiments with the ways his, his texts are produced and, and laid out and put forward, in, uh, particularly in his early days. Um, so, I mean, Derrida was obviously fascinating to me then, and uh, I subsequently went on to do some work uh, in my own PhD, but also later on uh, in postdoctoral setting uh, in his relationship with Judaism, which is a kind of interesting undertone of his, of his work. Um, I mean, his own biography, he's born in the 30s in what is now Algeria. He's a French citizen and obviously spends most of his time and his teaching life in France, and he comes to France as a student, but still has that kind of Algerian uh, Jewish community uh, heritage and background, which influences, I think, quite a lot of his perspectives upon uh, his work as, as almost a, an outsider to the mainstream, somebody who has experienced colonialism and anti-Semitism firsthand, uh, who was kicked out of his school in the 1940s because there was an edict from Vichy France uh, about the participation of Jews in public education. And I think these, these experiences clearly mark something of his work, uh, which I think partly is driven by an attention to what is marginalized by philosophy, by the big discourses of Western theory, uh, trying to expose us to some of the, the difficult and hidden and uh, troubling margins uh, the underside, if you like, of our thinking. Uh, and of course, he does draw on his heritage in more explicit ways. I mean, certainly his engagement with Judaism and later with Christianity, I think, are informed very much by his, his autobiography, um, his affection for St. Augustine, a fellow North African, as he sees him. Uh, 
uh, his, his use of Jewish motifs and Jewish poetry, I think are very much part of the mix of what makes him a fascinating uh, thinker for a religious and theological perspective, as well as, if you like, a purely philosophical or literary perspective, which are the other ways in which he's read. Um, so I think Derrida sort of bursts onto the philosophical scene in the mid-60s, where a number of books which are quite seminal are published, and uh, among these you have of grammatology, speech and phenomenon, and margins, of, a little later margins of philosophy, but also in the mid-60s, writing and difference, um, in which he, he takes on some of the established philosophical standpoints and schools of his time, like structuralism and phenomenology, and Heidegger, and psychoanalysis, uh, and gives them his own distinctive reading. Uh, and already, I think, at this stage, he's, in, he's engaged very much with theological and religious themes. I mean, the, the early writings about negative theology come from this phase. His engagement with Edmund Yabesh, his Jewish poetry, again, comes from writing a difference onwards. So at an early stage, he's engaged with religious and, and theological motifs and thinking. Um, sometimes I think Derrida's read as though he had a late turn towards the political and the ethical and the religious. And certainly I think they become more explicit themes later on, but I think there's quite a profound continuity in his work. And certainly rereading recently of grammatology for something I was working on, I can see his analysis of uh, the nature of humanity and the nature of language laying foundations for what he'll later say about the nature of otherness, um, animality, which becomes a big theme in his writings, uh, and the ethical implications of all of those things. So I think there's a continuity in Derrida's work, which is, is, it is marked by shifts and changes of emphasis, as you would expect over a long career. Uh, and it was in the early 2000s that he died. So he had sort of 40 years of very productive writing. Um, but I think there is a continuity within, that, within the shifting landscape of that. Um, it's been very interesting to see Derrida more and more taken on board by religious and theological thinkers. And one thing I, I, I've mentioned in my published work is uh, the occasion when he visited the, the American Academy of Religion Conference. And it was an amazing event because there must have been 1,000 to 1,500 people gathered in an enormous hall where he was interviewed by other philosophers like John Caputo. And I think a real sign that Derrida's influence wasn't just in, as it had traditionally been in literature and philosophy, but was increasingly in religious studies and theology, um, and a fascinating kind of conversation about themes of prayer, faith, witnessing, negative theology, mysticism, the messianic, all of which are increasingly important themes in Derrida's work as he goes through his career. Thinking about Der Derrida's intellectual context, one of those main uh, conversation partners early on certainly is phenomenology, which is associated particularly with Edmund Husserl in the earlier part of the 20th century. It's a school of thinking that's hugely influential on people like Sartre, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, uh, Beauvoir, and so on. Uh, in some ways, phenomenology is a very, very simple idea, but within it, a lot of complexity as well. The catchphrase or, or a slogan associated with it is to the things themselves. Phenomena means the things as they appear to us, as they're given to us in consciousness. And what Husserl advocated was a method of doing theology, which was a little bit related to what Descartes tried to do. Setting aside our natural assumptions about the world and, and our natural attitude, as Husserl uh, expressed it, and the, the natural attitude that there is an objective world out there, that we are subjects in relationship to objects, and simply attend to the way in which things appeared in consciousness, the way in which things were given to us in consciousness, and to try to discern the essences of ideas and the objective connections between ideas as they presented themselves to us. So to kind of bracket out assumptions about the nature of reality, I think phenomenology uh, is deceptively simple on the surface, but leads to an enormous amount of speculation of very interesting and complex sort on the nature of consciousness, the nature of intentionality, because for Husserl, consciousness was always consciousness of something, uh, consciousness in the presence of something that's given. Uh, 
uh, the nature of temporality, and all of these kind of ideas, seeking an objective foundation for knowledge, certainly, but doing it in a very sophisticated, uh, analytical way. So it becomes very profoundly influential. I mean, when, when Heidegger and others um, take up some of the themes of phenomenology, they, they break with Husserl in many ways, but they're still trying to give as accurate accounts as they can of how things appear to us, how the structures of being and existence manifest themselves to us in their appearance. Now, Derrida is kind of very much influenced by this, as are other people. But he comes to take quite a critical stand towards this, because what he locates as the, the crucial aspect of Husserl's philosophy is an appeal to presence. The idea that there is a pure present in which things are given to us. Uh, now, although in some ways it's simplistic to say it's simply like that, I think for Derrida, at the root of Husserl's desire to find some absolute genesis, some absolute beginning point for knowledge, he has to come back to this um, pure living presence, as he calls it, um, in which things are immediately known. Now, for Derrida, this is not possible because of what he calls différence. It's a kind of word that he coins in French. Um, and it's a word that can only be read. It can't really be heard because différence in French is simply the word that means difference. But when he writes it, he substitutes an A for one of the E's. So he writes it uh, with the, the second E changed to an A. So it sounds the same, différence. But what Derrida means by this kind of new word that he invents is a combination of both difference and temporality. 